all right so hello everyone my name is viraj and today we are going to have a post contest discussion on uh, the lead code weekly 410th contest from tla eliminators we'll be discussing all the four problems all right so let us start i'll shift to a new page and let's look into the first problem so very easy very simple uh, some slight mathematics problem you can say although they had already defined a lot of part for uh, your pre your easiness you can uh, definitely uh, calculate the answer yourself so there is a snake in n cross n matrix grid and can move in four possible directions each cell in the grid is identified by the position grid of i of j where this formula is very neatly given that if I'm standing at grid of i of j, then the cell value would be i into n plus j. So it's given to you. You don't need to calculate this otherwise. Although it's kind of a convention how we follow when we actually try to number some cells in 2D matrices for the beginners. So maybe you can also remember this point the next time you encounter such problems where this thing is not given. All right. So the cell starts, uh, the snake, snake, sorry, starts at the cell zero and follows a command of a uh, sequence of commands. You are given an integer n representing the size of the grid and the array of string of commands where command of i is either up, right, down or left. Very straightforward and obvious. And it's guaranteed that the snake will remain within the boundary. So that is also something they have given for you. Easy enough problem there. You don't have to consider or even bother thinking whether the commands that the snake will follow will make him jump out of the grid. He is going to always remain inside the grid. All right. Now you have to simply return the position of the final cell where the snake ends up executing the commands. So very simple, very straightforward problem. Just we need to simulate the problem as it is. I can see commands is very small in 100 order. Even if it was a higher order, we can just simulate the process. It would give us the correct answer. So what we can say is simply, if I'm standing at cell zero, I'll say, all right, let me have some current cell value, which is initially starts off with uh, zero. And then I can go on to change whatever I want according to the directions up, right, down, left. All right. So let's try to identify this problem uh, as in the cell value which we are talking about in a different ideology. All right. So what I'll do is I'll I'll do is I'll draw a grid for you. So we'll have, let's say, a three by three grid. One, two, three, three. All right. I'll draw some cells and I think, yeah, this should work. Now, what I'll say is, I'll say, all right, I have this as zero, zero, one, two, this is one and two. Now, when I want to make these cells, I want to find the number of these cells. What am I eventually doing? I'm saying, all right, take I into N plus J. And in this case, I know N is equal to three. So when I do this, when I, when I talk about this, that, uh, that would mean for me that this gets numbered as 0 into 3 plus 0. So this is 0. This is 0 into 3 plus 1. This is 1, 2, 3. Then so this is 3. Sorry, one, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Now the problem is, if you maintain this cell value, if you maintain this cell value, let's say you're standing at cell number 4. And let's say I tell you that you want to move to the down cell. That means you want to jump to the 7 cell. Maybe you can find a good mathematical formula to maybe shift your direction from 4 to 7 if your command is down. That will work. If let's say I want to go to right, you want to go from 4 to 5. Up, that means 4 to 1. Left means uh, 4 to 3. Maybe some math mathematical formula will work. But in a very beginner format, what we can do is, very straightforward thing. Why would I maintain the cell every time I'm calculating my answer? Rather, in a very simple logic, let me maintain i comma j as positions. That means initially I am at, if I am at this cell, that's actually saying that I am at i0 and j0. And then now, if I tell you, you want to move down, right, up, or left, what do you have to do? Let's look. If you want to move right, that means you simply want to increase your j. If you want to move, let's say, left, then that means you simply want to decrease your j. If you want to move up, that means you want to increase your, sorry, decrease your i. And if you want to move down, that means simply you want to increase your i. So now that I can record my uh, movement in this format, that's i comma j, I no longer have to bother any mathematical formula. And now let's say I have executed n commands. 
after n commands whatever is my new updated i dash and let's say j dash to this i can insert this i dash and j dash over here and this pops out my correct answer because at the very end the question is asking you to report the cell number not i comma j indexes but i am not calculating cell number every time i am simulating the process after the whole simulation is done i can simply return that i know this formula is neatly given to me and initially by this simple logic i will no longer be requiring any mathematical formula so for all the beginners out there that's why i've stretched the problem a bit for the beginners out there you can follow such an approach where you don't calculate every time and if you want you can maybe calculate some complex or some maybe some uh, maybe some uh, good uh, equation also that might not require this i comma j maintenance maybe you can directly jump between num cell numbers that's going to be again an implementation difference that's all but i just wanted to cover this part for approaching the problem in a much uh, visualized way all right again easy enough problem does not require any more addition than this so let us try to look at the code quickly and we'll understand the problem very 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 easily all right i have these two values uh, the two uh, sorry coordinates i maintain the i and the j i go to each and every command is the command up that means is the first letter of it up just again an implementation difference maybe you can write this as fully up down right and left i just check the first letter because i know first letters are going to be unique it's either u r d or l so i'll say all right is it u decrease i is it d increase i is it r increase j and if the fourth case obviously it's l that means decrease j and at the very end simply return i into n plus j so very 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 simple and straightforward solution this is going to run in n complexity where n is the order of command so i can say time complexity is going to be o of n and space complexity is going to be simply constant because i'm not using any extra space to further propagate my idea so if i submit this out you can see it's going to run very well uh correct gets an accepted solution all right all right good to go let us start off with the second problem now count the number of good nodes so now this is like i i should not say this is a very beginner friendly problem this is uh somewhere between i can say medium to hard problem on based on the fact that it requires a prerequisite of understanding how do we work with trees all right so let's look into this problem there is an undirected tree with n nodes labeled 0 to n minus 1 rooted at the node 0 you are given an 2d integer array edges of length n minus 1 where edges i is equal to a of i comma b of i indicating that there is an edge between nodes ai and bi in that tree now a node is good if all the subtrees rooted at its children have the same size all right return the number of good nodes in the given tree a subtree of a uh, tree name is a tree consisting of of the node in the tree name and all its descendants so if you are talking about a subtree that means count that node also and whatever number of nodes fall below that everything gets for, uh, counted that is called the descendants part all right so let's do let's try to picture and simply imagine this problem so i think in the diagram they have made it pretty clear over here let's say your tree looked something like this then the blue ones have been marked as the good nodes why if i talk about this node that's node number 3 i i think you can see my uh, i think it should be pretty observable in my video the mouse pointer that i'm moving so if you look at this 3 if i talk about 3 let's see its children its children is this subtree that gets chopped off it's this subtree that gets chopped off in both these subtrees the count of nodes is 1 over here also one node over here also one node that means if i say for this node what is the unique count of subtree sizes then you will say one because one is coming only one only uh, like only one is coming and it's coming two times and nothing is getting repeated let's say i talk about this node why this node to not mark blue because i look if in the left direction this child has a subtree size of 3 whereas the right side has a subtree size of 1 so will this will that make this node a good node no because the children have different sub sizes subtree sizes and the uniqueness is not no longer 1 it has increased from 1 over here it's 3 and it's 1 so basically uniqueness has become 
टू सो इफ आई वुड हैव टोल्ड यू हाउ मेनी डिफरेंट यूनिक सबसाइजेज वुड देयर यू वुड हैव सेट टू एंड आई वॉन्ट यूनिक सबसाइजेज टू ओनली बी वन इफ इट्स ग्रेटर दैन वन दैन दैट स्पेसिफिक नोड इज नेवर अ गुड नोड राइट सो नाउ बेस्ड ऑन दिस आइडिया इट इट्स वेरी कॉमन सेंस पॉइंट टू से दैट अ सिंगल लीफ नोड लेट्स आई टॉक अबाउट फोर एट सेवन सिक्स फाइव अ सिंगल लीफ नोड इज ऑलवेज अ गुड नोड बिकॉज इट हैज नो चिल्ड्रन सो यू कैन से इफ इट्स नो चिल्ड्रन देन द सब ट्री साइज इज जीरो एंड इफ द सब ट्री सब ट्री साइज इज जीरो देन आई नो देन दिस नोड इवेंचुअली द लीफ नोड विल बी काउंटेड एज अ गुड नोड सो लेट्स लुक एट दिस केस ओवर एयर वेरी गुड डायग्राम ओवर एयर दिंग ऑल द नोड आर गुड वाई लेट्स लुक एट फोर थ्री फाइव एंड सिक्स वेरी ऑब्वियस इफ आई टॉक अबाउट फोर फोर ओवर एयर दिस फोर इट्स ऑब्वियस इट्स अ लीफ नोट गेट्स काउंटेड थ्री लीफ नोट गेट्स काउंटेड फाइव डेफिनेटली अ लीफ नोट गेट्स काउंटेड सिक्स डेफिनेटली अ लीफ नोट गेट्स काउंटेड बट वॉट अबाउट वन वन हैज टू चिल्ड्रेन बोथ टू चिल्ड्रेन हैव द सब ट्री साइज वन सो द यूनिक काउंट इज स्टिल वन वन इज अगेन अ गुड नोट वॉट अबाउट टू टू हैज सब ट्रीज Two sub trees, both sub trees have size one. Over here also one size. In the right also one size. So two is also a good node. What about zero? In the left side, the sub tree size is three, one, four, and three. These three nodes together form a sub tree size of three. What about the right side? Over here also three. So overall uniqueness of saying the sub tree sizes is still one. That means zero as a node is again counted as a good node. Hence you can say that I total get seven nodes as good nodes. right similarly the example 3 can also be taken again a very like a if if you understand example 1 and example 2 it should be very very pretty evident that you will get example 3 very quickly all right so now what about solving the problem how do we actually go about this part now the solution seems pretty clear if we are aware with how we normally traverse in a tree all the problem is requiring is a small modification during the calculation of subtree let's go into that So I'll change my page over here. So all the problem is asking is if, when, we calculate, calculate the subtree sizes. Let's try to also check uniqueness of. those sizes of those sizes so this becomes a pretty standard problem up till here this becomes a pretty standard problem how would you calculate the subtree sizes this is a standard problem i would say that you can maybe uh, search this up on google or uh, directly you will find some problem on lead code where all the problem will be talking about calculate calculate subtree size subtree size and the general pseudo code of how this is followed is that we start off by a simple dfs call dfs is the way to go around like that's the very basic again there can be multiple different ways to do this but DF, dfs is the most basic way to go about you say that currently i know that the tree is rooted at 0 so i'll say make a dfs call from 0 that's the node initially the parent can be negative 1 and then i have the agency matrix that tells me that where do i have to eventually picture out and then this dfs call is made further and further and further and further and so on and you try to traverse each and every node and once once you try to come back once you try to return you try to return back the current subtree size which gets cumulated 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 and finally you get the answer that's a general pseudo code we'll obviously be looking into the code to get a, get a better approach of that part but now if you are aware with this even if you are not we'll just go into the code and you will understand this quickly but if normally you are aware with this or assuming that you can say i will be able to calculate the subtree size what are you eventually trying to do if let's say i have a i have this subtree that's zero let's say it was connected to one let's say this was connected to two and so on there was some connection three connections over here three connections over here so eventually when you would have made a call from zero you would have gone to this one done whatever you wanted to do and then come back and then when you would have come back you would know that the size of this subtree is let's say s1 and then when you would have made your call to the next child which is two over here you would have done all that you want over here and then you would have returned the size of this subtree let's call this s2 and then s1 plus s2 
plus one plus one why because I am counting this node itself. That's the zeroth node. I would have returned this value total from outside this tree. Now, when you actually do this, look at this. You have S1 and S2 with you. And all you want initially is to somehow check whether S1, S2 and so on, if there were some S3 also, there was some S4 also and so on. What is the uniqueness among this? So how do I do this? Can I not maintain a set? A very simple data structure which helps me maintain the uniqueness or maybe a map or even further to better my case, can I maintain an unordered set? The answer is yes. Because all I need to see is how is the uniqueness occurring for all this S1, S2, S3, so on. That is the subtree sizes when I'm standing at this node. So I'll say, all right, maintain an unordered set in the DFS call when you would have done this. And when you, once you get S1, S2, S3, so on, till whatever is the maximum subtree mm -hmm. size you can have, that would be, let's say, SC, that is the number of children of the zeroth node, insert all these numbers in the set. Let's call this unique set, US. And when you do that, can you not say that the very end, whatever is the size of this set will give you the very good answer of justification whether this node was a good node or not. How will that happen? Two cases can rise. Let's bifurcate these two cases. If let's say the unique size size set this this sets if the total capacity of this set has gone to one sorry greater than one greater than one then will i say that this node is a good node i'll say no node is not good if let's say it's equal equal to one then will you say yes the good node is good yes you will say yes the node is good because all the children, I calculated each and every subtree size and the uniqueness when I inserted them in a set, the unordered set's size was still one. That means it was only filled to the capacity of one. So I'll say, yes, this node is good. Yes, node is good. And one more corner case, which we discussed. It can happen that the set size is also zero. When can that happen? That can happen when you say that like it's again an implementation uh, thing that we are discussing over here. Maybe you write your code in such a way that you don't pop up these exact three cases, but these two cases are definitely going to be there. So I'll actually, when we discuss the code part, you will get this uh, logic. But over here, I have also taken the case when the set size still remains zero. And that case for my coding logic would denote or tell me that yes, the node is still good because the node was leaf node. Node was leaf node so it's still good leaf leaf node so still good this is the whole three cases that i made in my coding problem now again implementation wise this can be very different people can do this without maybe let's say calling a dfs maybe doing this in a stack version maybe you can have an iterative dfs maybe you can have a recursive dfs it's totally up to you but the base logic is somehow very simple. You All you want to do is simulate this subtree size calculation. That's this coding part that I told you. It's a very standard problem. And you just need to modify it a little bit to calculate the uniqueness also. And that can be done with the help of a very simple data structure that's set, or in my case, unordered set. And you can maybe further do that maybe with the map or maybe some other logic also. All that you want is how well are you able to maintain whether the uniqueness is there or not and calculate that unique part. All right, so very, very simple enough problem now. Let's look into the code and understand. All right, so I have used a recursive DFS sort of an approach. What I'll do is I will first calculate the edges, total, total number of uh, edges that I have, that's N. Now I know that they have given in this solution only that if there are n nodes, then the 2D array size is n minus one. So that means it kind of dependent over here only that edges size is basically the number of nodes I can have. Just for safe side, I have made my agency matrix to be n plus five uh, total size. Now I've gone to each and every edge and I've created an undirected sort of a graph, but in this case, maybe you can say a tree where I have pushed back IT zero to IT one. That's a connection from A to B and IT one to IT zero. That's a connection from B to A. So an undirected edge has been created. 
and then I simply call the DFS function passing initial parent as negative one, current node as zero because it's rooted at zero and the agency matrix and then I return count of good nodes which is a public variable that's globally initialized outside the calls. Now in the DFS call, what do I do? Simply the parent, the node, the agency matrix. Initially the current subtree size is one because I know currently I know that this all this is for counting this is for counting the node itself because I know that the total subtree size is basically that node getting counted plus whatever is the subtree size of all the children's. So initial subtree size is one then I have an unordered set which is the unique sizes of the subtrees and then I iterate in the agency matrix of the node I'll say I go to the child. If the child is equal to parent, I don't want to backtrack, don't want to backtrack, want to backtrack. So I'll say, let me skip this, continue. Again, very simple DFS call. All those who can follow with general DFS, they will get this very easily. Then I will calculate the current subtree size that will get returned from this DFS call. You can see it's of int type. And then this current subtree size will get added to the main subtree size. I will add this. And then I will insert this current subtree size in the unordered set also. Now, if after I end this for loop, I have basically calculated all the subtree sizes, added them to the main subtree size, and also inserted individual subtree sizes into a set. So when I come out of this, if I think that the current unique sizes unordered set size is less than equal to one, what would that would mean? If it's equal to one, if it's equal to one, that means this node is not a leaf node, that's obvious. But then also every children had a subtree size, which was all same. That's why the unique, uh, unique sizes would have been, a uh, unique sets size would have been one. Or even if it's zero, what would that mean? If it's zero, then that would mean it's a leaf node. Because if it's a leaf node, you would have never gone in this for loop. Because if it's a leaf node, it has no children you would have gone in this for loop, you would have skipped everything and you would have not gone further down. And that would mean you would have never inserted anything in the unique sizes. If you never insert anything in the unique sizes, what does this indicate you? As per my logic, again, I'm focusing on this part, code problem and implementation can be a bit different. That's not a big deal. But for this recursive call, which I'm showing you, if you're able to catch up with that part, this is how I'm doing. You can say, yeah, unique sizes when it turns out to be equal to zero, then that means I'm standing at a leaf node. Leaf node always has to be counted as a count of good nodes. So I'll say, in any case, increment my count of good nodes by one. And then return the subtree size, obviously, because I want a recursive call. So just like I showed over here that once you have actually done whatever you want from this part, whatever you've done from this part, then you want to return S1 and S2 plus one and total size again, from the uh, to its uh, predecessor and so on, so on, so on. That kind of in a recursive call gives the upper nodes the chance to calculate their uh, successors or their children's subtree sizes. All right, so very simple recursive sort of an approach. Now, again, if I just remove this unique sizes factor and so on, this problem simply becomes uh, what you can say, a problem of counting the total subtree sizes or maybe something like that. But the problem right now required us to do a small modification on top of normal conceptual conce conceptualizing of how we calculate subtree sizes, hence this sort of a logic. All right, now what would be the time complexity? You are definitely inserting the edges over here. So I can say this is uh, O of N. Yes, this is in N complexity. And then the DFS, DFS obviously runs in N plus M complexity, right? Where is like a general DFS uh, logic. So N plus N complexity, again, like if I say n, n being the number, or you can say v plus e complexity, v is the number of vertices, e is the number of edges. Again, being in n order only. So you can say overall, the time complexity is going to remain in n order, right? In a rough approximation. That means if I say, what is the time complexity? You will say O of n only, which roughly works for 10 power five order, and it's not going to give me a TLE at all, correct? Or n, you can say n, plus, n for that, plus v plus e, something like this, where v is the number of vertices, but number of vertices is also, uh, n, n only and number of edges is n minus one. So overall it's n plus n plus so on. So you can say simply approximately this is okay. Now what about space? Now I'm using an extra space to calculate this agency matrix. Maybe we can do this directly with the edges, although the edges won't give us this uh, maintenance of the agency. So if you talk about the agency matrix, you can say that agency matrix will have the size of n plus five that I have declared over here for this order. So you can say, 
it's kind of dependent on the total length of the edges so space complexity also turns out in o of n order where whatever is the total number of edges is the total number of insertions i am trying to maintain in this vector of vector all right so standard enough problem like a standard problem when it comes to the dfs part right and uh, the subtree calculation part uh, i hope that clears up most of our idea let's move on to the next problem all right so problem number 3 find the count of monotonic pairs 1 you are given an array of positive integers nums of length n we call a pair of non negative integer arrays array 1 comma array 2 monotonic if the lengths of both the arrays are n so i want a uh, the both arrays to have the same length as the initial array and array 1 should be monotonically non decreasing that means strictly uh, sorry not strictly you can say simply increasing order right monotonically non decreasing means uh, increasing order and array 2 should be monotonically non increasing that means a simple decreasing order and array 1 plus array 2 individually each array 1's ith number plus array 2's ith number should give me the resultant sum as equal to that exact nums of i for every i from 0 to n minus 1 now i have to return this count of monotonic pair and since the answer may be very large i have to return this in 10 power 9 plus 7 modulo all right so let us try to understand what the problem is asking us so i'll take this example 2 3 2 2 so let's say nums was given as 2 3 and 2 so what i'll do is i'll say i have an array 1 i have an array 2 and there are three places empty for me to fill in all of these arrays now i'll say all right what you can do is you can start to say i am going to pick or try to fill this position with a number which starts with 0 and goes to a limit to this number 2 why because what i'll do is i'll say any number between 0 to 2 if it's filled at this position let's say i fill the number 1 then which number will i have to automatically fill at this position obviously if this is nums and i want the condition to to be followed as array 1 of i plus array 2 of i should be equal to sum of i that means that means i know if i fill a 1 over here i will have to fill 2 minus this number that's 1 again over here that is very evident so what are they trying to say do this filling as you want let's say i filled it like this i said all right i'll fill a 1 over here so this gets filled with 1 let's say i fill a 3 over here this gets filled with 0 let's say i fill maybe a 0 over here this gets filled with 2 do this filling as you want and create your two arrays but when you do this make sure that this filling finally gives you array 1 in a increasing order increasing order and array 2 in a non decreasing order or simply decreasing order so this is where the whole crux of the problem is selection was not a big point i said yeah i can select it but i have to make sure that increasing and decreasing pattern is followed so over here this filling i did although is in the range where this condition is fulfilled we can see 1 plus 1 is 2 3 plus 0 is 3 0 plus 2 is 2 so i get back the nums array 2 3 2 that's very right but the array 1 and the array 2 they are not following their own separate conditions i can see array 1 is not increasing 1 2 3 increases but then 3 2 0 decreases and similarly array 2 is not decreasing that's why out of like for this example 2 3 2 a feasible example now would be for example i say 0 1 1 and then i can call this as 2 2 1 this is a possible filling why because if i add back these numbers this gives me 0 plus 2 this is 2 1 plus 2 this gives me 3 and 1 plus 1 this gives me 2 and this array is increasing 0 1 1 and this array is decreasing 2 2 1 2. so array 1 condition and array 2 condition both are fulfilled and i'll say this is a good or a correct monotonic pair monotonic mono uh, tonic pair tonic pair sorry for the spelling and i will count this as a possible answer that's why in the uh, question you can see that 
four good pairs are feasible. They have listed all these four pairs. And if you check them out, you will see that, yeah, they follow the condition. And if you will try to brood this solution with pen and paper, you will see no other case is actually getting the correct uh, conditions fulfilled. That's why only these possible pairs are correct. Now they can go very huge. Over here, let's say I took only a small array of four size, but the answer went to 126. That's why they have also given that if the answer goes very large, try to bring it down by turning it modulo 10 power 9 plus 7. All right. So I hope now the question has become clear. Now let us try to look into the observations. All right. So I'll talk about this array only. 2, 3, so it was very evident that if I'm talking about array one and I try to fulfill any one position at a single point of time, it would be obvious that I would try to fulfill the position from left to right. I'll say, all right, fill this position, then fill this position, then fill this position. So that's very obvious, a simple simulation. But along with this, I also know that array two is something that gets automatically fulfilled, uh, sorry, filled. Because if you, let's say you fill any number x over here, then all you have to fill over here is 2 minus x. So do you need to maintain any array 2 for that purpose? I'll say no, I don't need to maintain any array 2. If I'm filling array 1, automatically I know what I want to fill at array 2. That's observation number 1. That's point number 1. All right. So now I know that array 1's dependency comes from, sorry, array 2's dependency is for every ith number comes from array 1. So no need to extra maintain array 2. If let's say I come to array one and I say I want to maintain array one, what exactly do I want to maintain array one? I know that since I'm fulfilling the condition always that when whichever number I pick from array one, the same number will be picked from array two by calculating with the formula that if array one number is x, then this is two minus x. If this is y, then this is three minus five. That is done. But what extra? Extra thing is if let's say in array one, I have filled a number x. Then the next number I pick, that is x dash, let's say x dash. I know x dash is going to be in a range from 0 to 3. It cannot go above 3, very obvious. But in 0 to 3, if it's 0, 1, 2, and 3, can I say I can take any of this phone number? I'll say no. Why? Because I know I have taken a number x over here. That means this x dash should be greater than or equal to x. So if let's say x was equal to 1, then can you take x dash as 0. No, I cannot take x dash as 0. Because if this is 0 and this is 1, then 0 is less than 1. And the increasing order is not followed. That is why, can I say that when I'm trying to choose a current number, let's try to let's try to bring the variables into picture. I'll say, I'll drop all this. I'll say that standing at a position, if I choose a current number, then I also want the previous number saved or chosen by me to make an informed decision of what possible current numbers can this place be fulfilled with. And this is where I can see now that I am maintaining a previous number which I want to full, fulfill, a current number which I want to fulfill and obviously I'm traversing from left to right, that means I am getting a recursive sort of an approach. I, I get an intuition of a recursive sort of an approach by maintaining some variables or you say states. And since this is a recursive approach, if I calculate the time complexity of this, it would very make, very simply make, uh, make me think that if I'm calculating a recursive approach, I would want to memonize it, memonize it, eventually making this problem a DP problem. All right. I hope this has become clear. Now, up till here, up, if you have read the problem clearly, you have seen the constraints. This should be very obvious that something related to DP has to be applied because of this maintenance of previous number, current number, where are you currently, what are you trying to calculate, and so on, so on, so on. So it kind of gives me a DP approach. So now since it gives me a DP approach, I'll start to define some states. So let's try to follow with that part. I'll say dp of i of j, what it is equal to, dp of i of j will be the number of monotonic pairs i can form till ith index, till ith index, if the last 
number selected is j i hope this is clear that means if the array 1 last number is j and the net size is i or you can say till the ith index i am calculating then what is the number of monotonic pairs i have i will store that in dp of i of j so what would be my answer what would be my final answer my final answer would be that till dp of n minus 1 that is till the last index all the possible j's in this case if you go back to the problem what we'll observe is nums of i is 50 that means the numbers are going to range from 0 to 50 so can i say that in dp of n minus 1 and if the last number is selected 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 so on or 50 all these will have some answer saved for n minus 1 at row and accumulation of them would have given me the answer so i'll say that my answer would look something like this accumulation of j equals to 0 to j equals to 50 dp of n minus 1 of j this is going to be my final answer that would mean if you would have taken all the numbers and the last number you would have selected to be placed would 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 have been j then accumulation of all such possible j's along the last row would have given you the answer that is the dp that we are going to define now once this is clear next thing that comes into mind is how how do we calculate this dp how do we change states or what is the transition when we see about states So let's go into that picture. I hope up till here everything is getting very cleared that we want to follow some state part. All right, all right, cool. Now let us try to move on, and we will see something very fun over here. Let's try to think of the base case. What do you think would be the base case? I know that if I am standing only at the zeroth index, and I am asking you what is the answer till the zeroth index, then what does this mean? It means that let's say the array is two, three. up till this index you select or fill this first position both in array 1 and array 2 by one number that one number will obviously range from 0 to 2 that is this first number and fill that position and then tell me what is the answer till that index so will you not say if i have a option to fill or choose from 0 to 2 then that means i can select let's say any number let's say maybe i select 1 fills gets filled at array of 1 this is array of 2 gets filled and this is 1 again now a singular size array will be increasing also and will be decreasing also always that means what can be my base case my base case can be that every number fill sorry every position in dp of 0 and this being 0 2 nums of 0 will be declared with 1 because that would mean if you would have been till or you would have talked about the 0th index till the 0th index and you would have taken any possible number from 0 to nums of 0 range then the answer or the number of monotonic pairs formed till that position would have been 1 this becomes our base case so now once this base case has been decided we can move on with our main transition so in the base case we can see that we have covered already the zeroth index that means till the zeroth index all my answers will be covered in the base case so i know in the main transition i want to start off with transition i want to start off with i greater than equal to 1 or simply i greater than 0 that means the index that i'll talk about or i should not name this as i let's have better something i n d should be greater than 0 so let's talk about the transition now what will happen you will say that if it be, if you would have talk about simple tabulation you would have said all right i have a for loop this is int of i i is equal to 1 and then i is less than equal to n and i plus plus that is the outer for loop this would have told me that i am trying to iterate from left to right 
and going at each index and calculating till that index what is the answer. Now what is the other state we are maintaining? Other state we are maintaining is like one, one state as I'll go back. One state we are maintaining is the till the ith index. That's the ith index we are maintaining. And the other state is which last number did you select? So I'll say inside this for loop, I would have another for loop. This for loop would denote what is the current number? What is the current number? What is the possibilities of the current number? And the possibilities of the current number is obviously zero. Two, what is the highest this current number can go? Can, I, can we say that the current number can go greater than whatever was in nums of i? No. So the highest limit on nums current number is nums of i. And I'll say current number, current number, plus plus. So I'll say this will give me all the possibilities. It will say standing at this i index, when you're trying to fill this position, all the possibilities are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so on, till nums of i. These are all the possibilities. But, 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 inside this for loop again, the question is, out of all the possibilities of current number, is every current number feasible for me? No. Because as we saw earlier, if you are trying to fill a current number, the current number's dependency is based on the previous number. It has to be greater than equal to the previous number you selected, else you cannot fill that current number over here. So can I not say that inside this, what I would do is I would run a for loop that would denote the previous number. It will say previous num or actually before this, what I'll do is I will calculate, I'll change my pen. I'll say int ways equals to zero. This is the number of a's currently I have starts with zero. And now I'll run another for loop, which is the previous number. It starts with zero and the previous number, previous number, previous number can be anywhere from zero to 50. That's the highest range for this particular question. So I'll say previous number plus plus. So what does this help me do? What does this help me do? I have three for loops now. What does this help me do? When I'm finally inside this position or I'm standing at this location, I'm standing at this location. When I'm standing at this location, I am trying to fill an ith index, obviously. And I'm trying to fill that ith index with the last position being filled by current number. But to do that, I am checking whether the last number I would have filled previously is that number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so on till 50. This is the for looping for all the possible combinations now. And now what will I do? Inside this, inside this position, I'll shift this on the next page. I will now say, if my previous number is less than equal to the current number, current number, this, what is this check denoting me? This check is for the fulfillment I would have done for array one. Because if this condition is true, then that would have meant current number can be taken as the last number to be filled now in array one's back position. And, 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 you also need to check array two, right? And, and, what will you say? You will say that nums of i minus current number, current number should be, should be, what, what would the condition over here should be less than equal to, you can say less than, sorry, less than equal to nums of i minus one minus previous number. If both these conditions are fulfilled, this is the condition for array two, because if array one the current number should be greater than previous number. That would mean increasing. And in array two, the number that should be placed over here would be this. The previous number in array two would have been this. And the previous number should be greater. That will give me a decreasing condition. If both these conditions are fulfilled, only then can I say that ways will get added with what? DP of Let's try to picture this. DP of what? If I am trying to fill the ith index, then that means I want the answer coming from i minus 1th index. Till i minus 1th index, what was the count of monotonic pairs? 
for which number ending last number what is the last number that ends over there if i am talking about i minus 1th index then the number that is ending over there is the previous number current number is placed at the ith index and at the i minus 1th i'll uh, actually try to a bit uh, write this clean away yeah dp of this would be i minus 1th and this would be previous number yes is that right because this would mean if you said that you wanted to take the current number then you checked of all the possible previous number positions possible for this current number which is fulfilling the condition if i say that any possible combination is getting fulfilled for a combination of current and previous then i would have said yes array 1 is getting fulfilled array 2 is getting fulfilled that means this current number can be taken as the last number both in array 1 and array 2 now till the ith index and if it can be taken how do you increment the answer you will say whatever is the number of monotonic number of pairs saved till the i minus 1th index add the previous number being last add that to the current number of phase do this for every previous number possible combination and when you get out of this for loop make your dp of i that is till the ith index was the answer current number being the last number current num equal to i'll say equal to phase so this is the whole idea behind the problem all right now again this problem could have been solved with recursion why i am now trying to do with respect to this contest is the fourth problem is a accumulation of higher constraints on this third problem itself so this third problem can normally be solved with recursion also by memorizing it all those who did did with that part kudos to that to create a extra added solution with higher constraints for the fourth problem this would be a problem where recursion would be very high to manipulate that's why we are going for a tabulation method and i'm trying to make the transitions as clear as possible all right so this is the whole idea behind the problem i will say that in this i'll repeat this again in a transition what i'll say first my transitions would accumulate from saying i want to go from index 1 to the last index because i want to find the answers for the left over rows that is from 1 1th index to the last index that's n minus 1th index inside this i will say all the possible current numbers that can be taken to fulfill the last placed position will be from 0 to whatever is the higher limit that's nums of i that's the only limit i can go to and now this current number if wants to gets fulfilled or if sorry not fulfilled you can say if this current number wants to get placed at the last position if let's say if let's say this is up till here let's say i have filled four positions and i am let's say i have filled four positions four positions are fulfilled and i am talking about this fifth position if this fifth position wants to get fulfilled with a current number that's a variable then you know, you would want to definitely know what was this previous number if this previous number is known to you only then you can say that i will fulfill this with this current number or not based on the condition that we discussed so i'll say for that check i will also iterate on all the possibilities of the previous number now previous number can be anywhere from 0 to 50 inside which i will ask myself if this current number is greater than previous number then it's increasing for array 1 and if this two values is like this placed in a condition then this is decreasing for array 2 if all these conditions are fulfilled now yes very rightly very rightly said i can truly make this current number my last number to be fulfilled in the array and that number of phase can be added how simply add dp of i minus 1 of previous of num which would denote that till till this ith index all the previous i minus 1th index number of pairs for which the last number would have been previous num add that that means up till here whatever is the answer up till here up till here that means if this is the previous number up till here whatever is the answer add that in the ways and when you finally come out of this loop all the possible previous numbers from 0 to 50 whatever answers they would have given cumulatively add that 
and finally make dp of i of current of num equal to phase all right i hope this fulfills our logic so what we'll do now is we'll look into the code part and we will understand how would we finally get an ac on this solution so here is the code all right just as how how i explained in the problem same i have coded up let's try to follow with that part i have an global variable m that's 1 e 9 plus 7 I take the size of the array, that's n, create a dp, where first state is the ith state, so I can go maximum till n plus 1, I have just taken for safer side. And the next thing is, what number are you ending with? And since the possibility of ending with is maximum in 50, for a safe side, I've just taken like 50 plus something, so almost like 55, and declared everything with 0. So this is dp. As explained, what is the state? dp of i of j would be the number of pairs, or monotonic pairs rather, monotonic pairs rather, you can say, till ith index when the last number you chose is j and the answer would be sum of dp of n minus 1 to j where j will belong from 0 to 50. And then what would be the base case? Base case would be dp of 0 of j where you will select if I wanted to select till ith index and I would have taken the last number as j then j would range from 0 to nums of 0. So I'll say run a simple loop from current number being 0 to current number being less than nums of 0 and utilize that to make every dp of 0 of current number equal to 1 which would mean only that single option where I would have said that yes alright in the single option stated where uh, I think I showed the base case yeah in the base case the single option that we stated where the only one number would be selected and that one number in array one will automatically be increasing because an array of single size is increasing and the other corresponding number in array two calculated with nums of i or nums of zero minus that number in array one would create a decreasing array. So that gives me a total of one monotonic pair till that zeroth position. So simply declared with the base case. Now I will go in the for loop. I'll say all right, start your index from one, let's go to less than n. Then this is the current number, the last number which you want to now place or the current number which you are standing at, which you want to keep at the last position, ranges from 0 to maximum of nums of index. That's the highest you can go, you cannot go above that. And for this current part, calculate the number of ways, all possible ways. Now all possible ways will come by saying that if I would have wanted to make this current number the last position, then what was the previous number? Previous number would have been anywhere from 0 to 50. So I iterate in all those possible combinations and simply say that, all right, if I think that the current num previous number is less than or equal to the current number, this is the array one's condition and, and to fulfill the last position for the array two is the current num uh, nums minus index of current number less than or equal to nums of index minus one minus previous number. If that is the case, then add to the ways and do this with modulo addition since we know that the answer can go very big. So ways mod m plus dp of index of i minus 1 previous num mod m whole mod m. Why this i minus 1 previous num as explained previously also, ith index we want or till e i n d index we want to calculate. So you will take whatever possible pairs would till i minus i minus 1 th index that is i n d minus 1 th index where the last number would have been previous num. Do this, store that in dp of index of current num outside this for loop, very important, and then count the total number of pairs by simply iterating on all the possible last numbers that is 0 to 50 for n minus 1th row or n minus 1th or simply saying the last index. Return that total number of pairs. All right. Now, what will be the time complexity for this? We know that the outer loop is running in n complexity. Inner loop is running in maximum of 50 complexity because maximum nums of index is 50. And inner, inner to inner loop is definitely running in 50. So overall, this runs in n into 50 into 50. You can say n into 50 into 50, which means overall the time complexity will be if, let's say, look at n, n is in 2000 order. 50 into 50 would be 250. So 250 into 2000 would eventually give me, if I say 250 into 2000, this would give me 50 and then 1, 2, 3, 4. So that approximately is 5 into 10 power 5 order and this 5 into 10 power 5 order is definitely going to work it's not going to give me a TLE at all what about space I'm using a space of n into 55 order or simply you can say 
n into or you can say worst case you can say 2000 into 50 order which would mean eventually 10 and then 1 2 3 4 this means 10 power 5 order so overall i can see tc and sc all are working great for me i know that i am running my solution in a very good time and space complexity so this gives me an accepted solution if i submit this it's going to work and we can see yeah gets an accepted solution all right so now this problem is fully solved and this is where things are going to get interesting so let's move on to the problem number four quickly we'll see that the problem number four is just a modification of problem one that's sorry of problem three and the only change they have done or lead code has done for problem four is the constraint on nums of i all right let's move on problem number four over here is exactly the same as you read only change is constraints now let's look at this constraint nums of i being thousand previously this problem had a complexity where i would have said this complexity being 50 into 50 into 2000 or if you write this in further logic let's take this to pen over here i would have said that currently my complexity would have been n into m into m where n is the size of the array and then m was 50 over here which was the maximum number i had in the array which was going maximum to 50 so this was the order n into m into m now if m goes to 1000 according to the fourth problem then this solution is going to fail because now the time complexity will be in order of you can say 2000 into 1000 into 1000 which means 2 into 10 power 9 and this is definitely going to fail definitely gives me a tail so i need some optimization so when i solve the third problem the third problem being a recursive problem a standard of yeah, taking not taking selecting previous and current it was very easy to come up with the states and transitions in the third problem the fourth problem was quite a challenge because the issue is now you need to optimize on the existing dp that's the answer that's the answer that's the case if i'm able to somehow optimize how am i calculating my answer maybe i can do something so this is what was running during the contest in my mind i said all right let's go to the individually each of these variables and ask myself what are they doing can i do it do it better all right i asked myself this n complexity let's change the pen this n complexity is coming from the reasoning that i want to iterate from left to right and go till every ith index can i hamper this can i change this anyway no i will have to go to every ith index so i cannot hamper this that means this n variable cannot be optimized now let's talk about this inner m variable that was coming from the inner loop this was running on the current number this was running on the current number i will obviously have to choose which current number i want to place at the last position either it would be 0 1 2 3 so on till the best highest limit that's nums of i i need to do that so i cannot hamper this but what about this inner m can this be hampered let's think let's think so what actually happened is when i was solving this problem and i came up with this equation let's try to look at it over here i'll copy the same solution let's go to the code over here i have emptied everything out and let's look look into an important part let's look into this line over here if i look into these two conditions individually what will happen let's observe you have an equation over here that said that i'll call this previous num pn is less than or equal to current number that's cn this is the condition one and and let's look into the condition two in this condition two if i make my previous number come this side and everything go to the right hand side what will happen it will look something like this pn is less than equal to cn minus nums of i minus one right no i think sorry plus yeah plus nums of i minus one minus nums of i this is what is going to happen so can i say that now the condition this condition of if bracket has changed to this you will say yes but the argument is how has that helped me now i am placing an and and between these two conditions can i merge these two of course can i say that pn being less than equal to cn and and pn being less than equal to this simply means pn has to be less than equal to the minimum of minimum of whatever is the cn 
करंट नंबर कॉमा सी एन प्लस नम्स ऑफ आई माइनस वन माइनस नम्स ऑफ आई कैन आई से इट लाइक दिस यस द आंसर इज यस नाउ वेन दिस इक्वेशन कम्स इन टू माइंड अप टिल हेयर ऑल यू हैव डन इज जस्ट रिटर्न मैथमेटिक्स एंड मैथमेटिक्स इन अ डिफरेंट फॉर्मैट बट दिस मैथमेटिक्स इज हेल्पिंग मी ऑब्जर्व अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट लेट्स गो बैक टू द कोड एंड अंडरस्टैंड दिस ओवर हेयर वेन वी लुक इन टू इन टू दिस कोड वॉट इज हैपनिंग इज इफ नाउ आई रिप्लेस दिस कंडीशन आई एल से इफ आई एल से इफ मिनिमम ऑफ आई एल से मिनिमम ऑफ करेंट कॉमा कॉमा I'll say this. I'll shift this to minus. I know I want current num. I want a plus again, and this is the value. So this gets inserted in between, and I can now remove everything over here, and this is the minimum, and it ends. All right, cool. So now that I have bifurcated my condition like this, an important point is. If you look into the outer loop of current num, initially current num is some value. Initially, let's say zero, one, two, three, four, and it is, and it's increasing. Obviously, it's increasing. It's going from zero to a higher limit. And when you look at this condition over here, what are you eventually doing? If in this line the current number increases, then will I say that previous number will have a higher range to carry? Yes. meaning what will i mean what do i mean by this let's see let's say your current number initially was 9 current number was let's say 9 assuming let's say just it was 9 so your previous number could have gone it would have gone from 0 right it would have gone and it would have gone maximum till 50 in this case i was talking about let's say it would have gone from 0 the range was 0 1 2 3 4 so on so on till 50 but tell me at a particular point let's say let's call that point x you would have stopped why because after this point you would have said that if this is this x point after this point i know that previous number will go greater it will go greater than the minimum of current number that's 9 comma let's say 9 plus some of that value like this this part this plot this is also some value let's say this this is some value let's say some value y so i'll say some value y over here obviously there is going to be some point from 0 to 50 where this condition is fulfilled and when this condition is fulfilled then you will no longer increment your ways will you do that i know that i am only incrementing it if i feel that previous number is less than but if it gets greater than then will you ever add no you will never add so let's try to look into this this in in a, in like a manner now let's say for a current number 9 you added everything that was there to add let's say you added everything that was there to add till this part up till this up till this part where where are you doing this look at this line over here you're simply saying index minus 1 and previous number so when previous number is 0 1 2 3 4 so on so on till some point of time where you think that now never condition is fulfilled you will say up till here i will add everything to ways so ways ways plus equal to whatever was possible whatever you can add till this part now let's say in the next time current number increases you end this for loop and next time the current number increases and current number goes from let's say 9 to a next higher value let's say 10 let's say assume just it goes to 10 obviously it's increasing it's going to stop at nums of i but let's assume that it went to till where nums of i was fair enough so i was standing at some n 9 number and now i shifted to 10 a higher num current number then what will happen you will again go inside this for loop you will again start your process again and you will again calculate all the possible answers for the same index i minus 1 at the same row because remember the outer loops ind has not changed so you will be remaining at the same ind minus 1 and you will say calculate your answer for 0 1 2 3 so on so on 4 so on till this x and now since current number has increased it has increased from 9 to 10 obviously i know if this value is increasing this value is increasing then pn will also increase the limit of which pn can go will also increase because 
this overall expression is going to increase. This overall expression increases. I'll change my pen. This overall expression increases. So Pn, if initially went from 0 to let's say x, it can now go from 0 to something above also x, something more than x. So you will say, I will calculate my answer for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, x, and some, let's say, one more value. Let's say it also goes to x plus 1, x plus 2 also. And now I will say, now I will stop. I'll say, up till here, the answers are possible for current number equals to 10. And I will add that to base. Now, how are you futilely calculating your answer? Observe this. If I would have known the answer, that is the cumulative sum till x for the current number 9, if I would have landed to a new number 10 and I know that this blue part has to be added already, then why am I calculating it every time? Why am I going back and starting all over from zero? Do I need to do that? If I am, if I have already know the answer till nine, till this ninth position, if I know, sorry, till this nine being current number, I know that the answer is zero plus one plus two, so on till whatever answers were possible till this position for previous number, for previous number then why do I want to reiterate again previous number to zero and go back to x plus one, x plus two, so on? Why do I want to do that? Can I not create some sort of a prefix sum logic, prefix sum logic and totally bygone the inner inner for loop, this inner for loop, which is reiterating back from zero. Can I simply bygone that? Bygone that? Yes, I can do that. How will I do that? Let's see. What will I say is, I will shift the number of ways outside, since this is the total number of ways anyways. And I'll say, I have a previous number outside which starts with zero, which starts with zero. So I will never make this previous number go back to zero again. I will now remove this for loop totally, and I will simply ask myself, is my previous number currently fulfilling the condition with the minimum? If it is, add on the ways, and increment your previous number. Simply do that. Add in a ways and increment your previous number. And increment your previous number as in previous number plus plus. And then when you finally end this if check, make for this current number, for this i get index, the number of ways. Now how will this help me? How will this help me? Next time, let's say the current number changes. It changes to a new value. Initially it was 9, then it went to 10. Then ways will not get redefined to 0 as well as previous number will also not get reinitialized to zero. It will continue from that position. So you would have reached till x and now you will calculate your answer possible for x plus one and x plus two. Also add that to ways and then for this current number that is 10, you will just simply store that number of ways and you will say new ways added. Now, how did this help me? This logic helped me bring down my time complexity. How? Because now I know that the solution is not in, uh, is not working in 50 order. It's working in 1000 order. So if I make a change over here, I'll say the highest I can go is let's say 1005. Over here, I'll say that the time complexity has switched to maximum of 1000. And over here, I can say that the time complexity has become n into 1000. And over here, I will say this is n into total. I want to go till all positions of 1000. So the time complexity would now be reported as 2000 into 1000, which would mean simply 10 power 6 order. And 10 power 6 order is definitely, definitely feasible for us to follow. Same would be the case with space complexity. And now this logic will work. Let's try to submit this and see. Definitely getting an accepted solution. All right. So what is the whole idea? What is the whole idea? Let's, let's try to revise this again. If I bring down my for what, what did I first initially do? I wrote a DP for this condition where this if condition was bifurcated into two parts. This condition was for array of, of one and this one was for array of two. But now what did I do? I said, let's accumulate this condition and reach on a singular condition. Why I did was is because if I accumulate this and reach on a single condition, I will observe a very crucial fact that for the out inner loop where CN is changing, if CN is increasing, it's going from zero to a higher limit, then the range of PN can follow is also increasing. And every time I'm futilously in the previous problem, let's try to compare in the previous logic, every time I am starting with num zero going till 50 
अगेन करंट नंबर चेंजेस गो फ्रॉम जीरो टू फिफ्टी अगेन करंट नंबर चेंजेस गो फ्रॉम जीरो टू फिफ्टी वाई एम आई डूइंग दिस आई डोंट टू डू दैट बिकॉज आई नो इफ करंट नंबर इंक्रीजेस सो विल द रेंज ऑफ प्रीवियस नंबर एंड द प्रीवियस आंसर्स विल ऑब्वियसली बी रिक्वायर्ड बाई मी प्रीवियस वेज विल ऑब्वियसली बी रिक्वायर्ड बाई मी सो वाई नॉट क्रिएट अ प्रीफेस लॉजिक वाई नॉट क्रिएट अ प्रीफेक्स लॉजिक एंड सिंपली से डोंट इनिशलाइज वेज बैक टू जीरो डोंट इनिशलाइज वेज बैक टू जीरो कीप इट जीरो मेक द प्रीवियस नंबर टू बी जीरो डोंट इनिशलाइज बैक and increment it till you can wherever you think you can stop stop and the current ways gets cumulatively added to dp of ind of current number all right so now again I, why i did not take this problem in a format of showing a test case doing that part because i cannot draw a dp of n cross 1000 in order to show you this logic you can sit down with a pen and paper create a small small very small dp with, uh, with you and try to understand the states it is definitely both of the problems are definitely a hard problem so for all the beginners out there i would advise you you can go into some dp solutions try to more lead code this part and get familiar with the idea of how states are maintained and tabulation is maintained for all those who have already done tabulation this will seem very very easy at least for the third question and now the fourth question would be an extra added extra bonus point to just have a single observation where the prefix sum was getting followed because of this logic that if till x my answer was present then why would i want to calculate answer again from 0 to x i can just simply save that in a prefix sum which would be number of ways never initialize it back to 0 and just add on whatever extra limit i could have gotten if current number would have increased from let's say 9 to 10 or some previous value some smaller value to some larger value and so on so on so on that would unnecessarily Uh, help me remove that inner to inner for loop which was running in a 50 time complexity over here in my code it would have run in 1000 time complexity but now that i have removed it completely i am only using two for loops to calculate my answer all right so fun enough problem right a de definitely a good problem i should say definitely a hard problem i don't know how many of uh, people were able to solve this uh, in the contest but yeah definitely you can uh, sit with a pen and paper try to look into the problem code the prefix sum logic that i told you and you will definitely definitely get this idea all right so thank you everyone thank you for uh, watching the pcd